This is Walt Kosmowski for BevCam, and we are here at uh, Salem uh, Cinema, where they have just finished screening the winning entries in the 2018 Cinema Salem Student Five Minute Documentary Film Competition. And uh, we will be reviewing those and showing those videos to you uh, during this program. And we will also be interviewing some of the young filmmakers who were part of the creative process of putting those videos together. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. How I popped my knee, and you're Demi Demitra, right? You told me earlier. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Demi Saramitas, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I shouldn't ask you what gave you the idea for this show because did you actually pop your knee? Yeah, that story is completely true. I woke up in the morning, got my tea, got slipped on the ice, slipped on my cat almost, um, just to go to school, just to pop my knee at, at school. So. And you know, it was very clever there, where you had that little scene where you slipped on the ice and dumped your coffee. Uh, and we're very careful not to do that again. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I tried to add some comedic effect to it just to make it lighthearted. Yeah, no, and you did a good job. Now, I, I, uh, I'm uh, uh, very pleased with the way that you set up your shots. Now, you set up the camera by yourself on a tripod and then, and then uh, saw the depth of field and saw, saw the... Uh, uh, the, the range and then you, you kind of stepped into the scene to take the shots? Yeah, so I, I did that basically, but I did have a friend behind the camera just to hit record. So I did have uh, a friend on set, but I did set up the shots them myself. And okay, and how did you get the cat to play his role or her role? <laughs> it's mainly just forcing her just to be in the way and I'm, <laughs> me trying to maneuver myself, so uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, and so uh, did you um, uh, did you tape this uh, and make this video with a mind to entering it in this competition? Yeah, so I, I 
popped my knee during the month of January, and then I got that flyer that came into my video production room at school, and I was like, perfect, that's the greatest <laughs> way to enter into this film contest. Yeah. Now, does Franklin High School have a uh, media department? Do you, do you take media courses? Yes, so I'm actually president of the TV club at the school, and the school is a new building, so we have a lot of new equipment and uh, a news production area where we generate the news every day, so we are really media-based. Yeah, and uh, do you know the, what the local access television station is in your area? Yeah, we're at the Franklin TV Community Access. I actually work there. I'm a staff there. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, involved in the town of Franklin. Okay, so you're still, you're still in high school? Yes, okay. I'm a junior. You're a junior. And, and so is, is, uh, is the uh, local access station located in the high school? No, so it's actually a different se whole section. There's a TV station at the school as well as a, a community access. Um, I've been working there since my freshman year, and it's been a blast. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Demi, is this something you want to continue as perhaps a, a career? Yeah, I, I plan to do that more in, in college and in life. So, yes, yeah. I do plan to do that. Do you have any concrete plans at this time? Uh, I'm touring colleges at the moment, so I'm, I'm going to make a concrete plan in the next year or so. Okay, very good. Well, Demi Ceremetis uh, from Franklin High School and... And uh, your video, congratulations, uh, congratulations, I should say, on your video, How I Pop My Knee. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Big welcome to Moonshine Falls. Hi, I'm Dave McEwen. I'm a musician. Um, I originally got started playing music when I was four years old. My father played the banjo and uh, he came home one day with a mandolin for me to play. Uh, the rest of the people in my family played my older brother and older sister. So that was my uh, turn to join the family band. And I started on a mandolin at four years old. Along the way, I picked up a uh, guitar that my brother played, uh, auto harp, bass, and I, I learned to play my father's banjo, and uh, pretty much anything else with strings. Uh, you know, it just takes a little bit of time to figure out the different chords and notes, but uh, once you learn one, the rest that follow are a lot easier. Uh, my favorite genre would have to be bluegrass. Uh, that's what I grew up playing, and uh, you know that's my you know my whole family played, and that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I currently play bluegrass with my fiance. We have a band called Moonshine Falls, and uh, we play at different festivals. Oh, it's funny, my first album was recorded really late in the game in my life. Uh, it was about four years ago, but I had played on numerous projects for other people as a sideman. So when I went in for mine, I pretty much knew exactly what I wanted. And uh, we were able to go in and get it done in a pretty short period of time. We had a lot of help. Uh, we did it down in Nashville with a guy named Tim Carter and he's a fantastic engineer and he helped me <clears throat> co-produce it so he figured out what keys are best for me and what tempos and everything and uh, it was a great experience. I, I actually had a really good uh, experience playing music through my whole life. Uh, when I was in my uh, late teens, early 20s, I met a group of uh, guys called the Gibson Brothers. And they're one of the top bluegrass acts in the country now. They do really well. Um, and along the way, I also met, uh, you know, I, I learned to work on instruments because I didn't have the money to pay people to fix my instruments. So 
As a repairman, I ended up going on the road with some uh, pretty famous musicians, uh, Pino Palladino. I bass teched for him, and uh, he's the bass player for The Who. I worked with him in another band called D'Angelo and the Vanguard. Yeah, through, throughout the years, um, most of my instruments came from my father. Uh, he, he bought a lot of instruments, and, uh, and we were always, or I was always welcome to them. Uh, so, you know, what if you know, I didn't have a banjo, I could just go take one of his banjos, and uh, he was always really free with that. Um, I've gotten a couple Martin D28 guitars, which are pretty expensive from him. And then, you know, in the past few years, I started building some, and uh, and I just bought another uh, Martin from the 1950s that uh, is a very collectible. She's the love all my life, spent the hours searching for the words to say. Uh, music is a great pastime. It can be a good uh, career if you are very dedicated to it and you put the work in. Um, if you're looking for a career where you don't have to do any work and you can sleep late, that it might not be the right career for you. Very good, and that was Music Man, and that was uh, produced by Molly Trumfio, right? And uh, Hudson High School, and you're Molly? Yeah, I yeah. am. Right? Yeah. And your friend there is? I'm Buffy Catella. <laughs> and uh, Buffy and Molly, and so what, what gave you the idea to do a documentary about the Music Man? Um, I really didn't know. Um, we had a project for um, a class I was taking, and I went through a lot of ideas, and I had really no idea what to do. And then um, I thought about my uncle and he like really inspires me to play music and he inspires me to become a better musician myself. So I thought I would make it about him. So so this is about uh, Dave McCune, is that his name? Yeah. So this is, uh, Dave McCune is your uncle? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. But da is Dave McCune your uncle? No, no. we're not related. <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking, Buffy, no, yeah. No. So how did you get involved with this? Are, are you, do you uh, do projects uh, with Molly? Um, this is okay. So I'm typically, I do scripted stuff usually. So, and this is a documentary obviously, but I work in the public access studio and I was after school and our teacher, Ms. Chilton said, hey, can you take a look at this documentary? Do you want to like edit it down? Because it was originally like nine minutes. Yeah. We wanted to get it down. So I edited it down, put some Ken Burns stuff in there, uh, did some L cuts, you know, uh, and just cleaned it up a little bit, and then it turned out really well, so I was really happy about that. Wow, you know the lingo, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yes, I do. I've been doing this for a long time, so yeah. yeah. Really? How long have you been doing? Uh, uh, yeah, four years. I started when I was 14, yeah. so yeah. yeah. So you're both seniors now? Uh, no, I'm a sophomore. You're a sophomore? Well, yeah. you've got a couple more years ahead of you, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm, I'm a senior. You're a senior yeah. now. And, and so you've, you've worked at, at uh, the Hudson Local Access uh, TV station. Is that located in the high school, by the way? Yes, it is, yes. So I, I am a summer intern there, and I work all year round there. Yeah. So what do you think? Does Molly have good prospects here for a career in... in uh... Yeah, we were just talking about this. I think she, she said she wants to go to film school now, and I'm hyped about that because I'm, I'm trying to get into film school right now. It's a hard process, but we're, we're, we're pulling through, you know. Yeah. Yeah, good, good stuff. So, uh, uh, how was your uncle Dave McCune about doing this project? Um, he, like, was like really into it when I talked to him about it, and I proposed the idea to him. He was excited. Yeah. 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 And you did this what in, in his home, the fireplace, and the way that was very nice. I like the way you set that up. Thank you. Yeah. We drove to New York to um, interview him at his house. So. Oh, did, okay. Yeah. Now, did you actually attend any of his performances? Um, I've been to a lot of his like film, uh, his festivals and stuff like that, and um, his shows and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what really hit me when when he talked about a Martin D28 guitar because yes. that is my axe, a yeah. Martin D20. <laughs> no, yeah, really? abs yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so as soon as he talked about this Martin yeah. D28, I said this is a good guy. Yeah. yeah. So now uh, you say you do have some plans to continue. Uh, uh, have you taken the courses at at uh, at Hudson High? Any of the media courses? Well, um, I transferred in to uh, Hudson in October, uh -huh. and I got put into uh, TV News as one of my classes. Yeah. And um, I didn't really know much about it, but uh, as the semester went on, I got really into it, and the final project was like kind of really one of my 
my interest like peaked in it. Yeah. And um, I made this documentary, and that's when I re I really liked it, and I knew I wanted yeah. to do something with it. Now the big question, though, how did your uncle like this? Uh, how how did he like the production? He's seen it, I take it. Yeah, no, he loved it. He wanted to come here, but you know, the drive from New York is not that quick. So. Uh, <laughs> so. What part of New York does he live in? Um. Ask mom back there. I, Westchester. All right, thank you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Westchester, New York. Well, so did you did you feel that you got you accomplished what you uh, what you set out to, to to do? Yeah, I just wanted to um, showcase his uh, talent and how much he inspires me. So I think I did that. Yeah, and I think you owe some debt of gratitude to your your cohort, Gabby, there, right? No, nope, Buffy, but you're close, <laughs> close. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. But she did a great job. When I first saw it, I was like, this is amazing. I'm like, this, it was so good, because. Like it, she just, really she just, she before. hadn't done anything yeah. before, and I was like, this B roll's solid. The inter, the questions were great. I loved it. It was really good. I loved it. Yeah, great. Yeah, you talk the talk too, Gabby, uh, okay. Buffy, whatever. <laughs> I'm just yeah, teasing I, you now. I, I interview people, so I have a, t I have a TV show where I interview people, so I like to, I like to talk a little bit. <laughs> so she's saying, what's this guy doing here? <laughs> All right. Well, that was um, the Music Man, Hudson High School. Uh, Molly and um, Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I could get that out of you. <laughs> so, the, the Music Man Hudson High School. Congratulations, ladies. Thank you. At a campground in Lebanon, Maine, it was 10 days ago, and 10-year-old Emily was impaled by a tree limb. Emily Malowitz is on a lot of people's minds in her native Millis. An 11-inch branch went through her chest. It took surgeons three hours to carefully remove the piece of wood, which came dangerously close to her heart. Hi, my name is Emily Malowitz, and I'm a senior at Millis High School, and I'm 18. Uh, what I remember about that day was, like, before the accident happened, we all went to the rectory department of the campsite we were at to play ping pong, and we were going to have a tournament. And then I remember hearing, like, raindrops hit the roof, and immediately after that, it was just like, they were slammed down the roof. It was like golf balls hitting the roof, and um, I just remember uh, it was, it almost got to the point where, like, we couldn't hear each other, and we were, like, a couple feet away, and then... Uh, my mom came to us and she's like, we're just gonna go to the tent. Uh, it's just a little storm passing over. We just all went back to the tent and then we were all just sitting there and my dad was outside. So Peter had gone I outside. Was, I went outside the tent because the tent was uh, having, we were getting water in the tent and all you remember looking off to the distance, probably about a hundred yards out and trees were at a, like a 90 degree angle. And I really didn't have a chance to react to anything. Well, we saw the car was totaled by a tree. By a tree, and the tree came down, landed on the van, and then landed on the tent. Just, I don't remember the tree falling. That was one thing I don't remember. And then all of a sudden, like, my family had to go into action, get this tree off my sister. My mom went to go run to go find someone to help my dad, who was lifting the tree off of me as they were waiting for the ambulance to come. My siblings obviously didn't know what to do. They were so, everyone was so caught off guard. I went and they looked. I went and remember going to the back of the tent. Couldn't find anything. I went to the front and there she was. So and I remember just grabbing her head and I'm like, Emily, say something to me. And she turned around and she looked at me and she says, Dad, I can't breathe. And I said, okay. She says, I can do this. Okay, and obviously the tree was on her. I went around and I picked up the tree because I knew help was definitely coming. And I was holding it and finally one guy came. He actually had a broken arm. Remember that? Yes, yeah. Um, but he was there to help. He had one arm up. We were holding the tr tree and then finally it took eight guys to take the tree and throw it to the side. Emily comes crawling out of the tent, goes right to my wife. Took Emily on a stretcher, took my wife, went in the ambulance. Uh, they noticed that they did an x-ray on her. They noticed that there was some kind of something inside her, about 10 inches long. And um, along with a lot of tent fragments, uh, top fragments, leaves, a lot of stuff. They took out, and from then on, she came. T she came to, and she she struggled. She had a collapsed lung, esophagus was damaged. 
uh, lining of the hot um, along with uh, three broken ribs I believe three broken ribs Emily is definitely an inspiration to all of us yeah because she, everything yeah. that she had to do to recover she did at 110 percent at that age I would like I don't know how somebody moves on from that um, as a family like we all are so inspired by her because she's just so strong and she shows us that every day we can be a better person and we can be so much stronger than before. I think someone that I find inspirational to me was my dad. He always, he always talks to me about it and um, I think knowing that someone's there and willing to talk about it with me, um, it means a lot to me. Um, sorry. Um, I, I love my dad. He, he does a lot for the family. Um, all my siblings were there for me. I am very proud of her and I respect what she went through because it's not easy to go through what you went through. Emily is our hero. That, that's bottom line. Yeah. Emily is our hero. Like, she's just my person. Like I'd be lost without her. Uh, love you a lot. I just, you know, I, I look at you day in and day out, and it, I know, and I, I haven't stopped. But I remember August 9th, I'm always in your room giving you a kiss. And that was Meet Emily. And I have with me Emily Melowitz. Hi. And her brother, Joseph Melowitz. Joseph Melowitz, yeah. And I have to, before I even start this, are you guys like, Quadruplets? Yes. I, I didn't realize. I, you, you look so familiar, or you look so similar d during the taping, and then it was the one shot where you're all sitting on the stoop, the porch stoop there, uh, that I finally, oh my goodness, they're, they're quadruplets, right? <laughs> yeah, so, we are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is a, a true life uh, 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 story, and uh, now you're, you're in um, um, Millis High School, right? And uh, uh, are you are you a student both students at Millis now? Um, yes, we are. Okay, and uh, do you take courses from Danielle Mannion? I do. You do? I take TV class with her. Yeah, Danielle is a good friend, and she's always winning these contests with her students. So she must be doing a good job, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So what made you what made you come up with the idea of of featuring Emily in this documentary? Well, um, I feel like I wanted to bring it back because it's it was nine years ago. So I feel like bringing it back now is a appropriate time to do it just to show that it's still there yeah and you had you had some of the original uh, footage uh, from the from, uh, from TV and and uh, and news uh, sources yeah um, there were it was on so many newscasts and everything and we had like all the CDs so Joe took them and they used them in the film yeah and now you uh, 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 I mean were you were you in fear of dying during that episode or did the doctor say that that it was close to you actually uh, uh, dying or, or was it um, I mean yeah definitely it was it was really close to my heart so yeah. I think that obviously had a big impact but there was just a lot of recovery and I don't think if I didn't have that survival mode in me I don't think I would have been able to live through it yeah and, and obviously uh, the the help of your siblings and your parents really contributed a lot to that tell mm -hmm. us about that um, yeah I think I mean I always said like in the video like my dad was the hero like he just took the tree off of me but my both my parents like all my siblings were there for me through the tough time yeah and and Joe who uh, did you you crew this whole thing and set up the shots what at home mostly and then from other video footage yeah there was uh, my sister and or both of my sisters were at the school and then my brother was at my house and I was also at the school yeah. And uh, so now, now, who were the other two siblings in the in the in the, in the quadruplets? Um, so there's my sister Catherine, who she goes to Millis High, and then my brother Ryan. He actually goes to a vocational school. Okay, and Ryan was also in the in the, uh, in the all four of you actually were in the yeah. were, were in the. So what what did you find the 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 toughest thing, uh, Joe, in, in this production? What did you find the toughest thing to do? Uh, honestly, I think the toughest thing would probably be learning to do everything because this was my first film. So learning how to like take shots and edit and um, just find out like the best scenes was probably the toughest. Yeah. So did a lot of stuff end up on the, as they say, on the cutting room floor? 
Yeah, there was there was like I think it was like forty minutes in total, and I had to bring it down to five minutes, which was also pretty tough. So yeah. So how did how did your how did your parents did you have, find it tough to enlist them in this project or not? Uh no, not really. I feel like they had a lot to say about it, so it was pretty easy for them just to go up and click record, ask yeah. some questions. Yeah. No. And uh, uh, do you have any aspirations to stay in film or do anything uh, uh, as a career uh, uh, after? Uh, did you say you're a senior now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. Don't really have any career plans to be a filmmaker at the moment, but we'll see. Yeah. And Emily, you were the you were the uh, the subject of this documentary. Are you are you in? Is that some of your hobbies or aspirations? Film or or what what is, what are your interests? Um, so, I mean, with the film and everything, I've never, I mean, it was, the video was all him, but I think telling people my story, I think maybe that's something that I'd like to do, like with him, show my video to other people as well. Yeah. Well, congratulations and, uh, and good luck. And, and, uh, it's good to see you, uh, surviving such a, such a, uh, you know, a, 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 a dramatic incident. Uh, which comes out of nowhere. The way it was portrayed there was very, very dramatic. So that was uh, um, Meet Emily, Millis High School. And uh, I have Emily Melowitz and her brother Joe Melowitz. Thank you, folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Mary Peacock from Mary Peacock Photography and this is my studio. So I've been doing photography since I was 13 years old. My dad bought me a camera one Christmas, actually gave me his camera from work um, and it was a 35 millimeter and I took an interest in photography at that age and once I started shooting I never stopped. I was always the person at the family party that had the camera. So I became a photographer at the age of 40 and when I was having my last child I started studying photography because I was home for nine months during the pregnancy. The internet had just come out and there was this new thing called YouTube and I learned photography off YouTube videos. Very nice. Turn your head to the left a little bit. So it became a business, a small business, when my daughter was born because I was taking so many pictures of her and all my friends were having children at the same time and asked me to take pictures of their kids. It started to become um, a lot of work and that's when someone said I should start charging for those photos. So it was about 2005 when I started actually feeling like I should charge for photos because I was doing so many for all my friends. So this is my lobby and this is some of the work that I've displayed this year. Every year we switch it out for new um, and fresh photos. Um, however, we keep everything and move them and shift it around the studio often. And this just displays the seniors that we've done this year. Um, some family photos that we've done as well. So right in here is our actual photography studio and where I do all of the editing of the photos. Um, this is the Mac that I edit everyone's photos on. It is a, my editing station. Um, the computer has all the programs I need. We have Lightroom, Photoshop, anything you can think of that I do for editing is loaded onto this computer. On this side over here is actually a headshot station I have set up for now. It's got a white backdrop. Um, people always ask and want to know what this is. It's a reflector. So people ask me about my five to ten year plan and my plan is to, to basically be doing what I'm doing right now. We're always refining the business. The workflow around here changes constantly. Every year we find new ways to make it run a little smoother. I don't ever think I want to retire from photography. I love it so much. I can't imagine not having something to do every day and if photography wasn't part of my life I probably wouldn't have another interest. Um, so I don't expect to ever give it up and I always expect to have this business in one form or another. Thank you. Very nice. Hang on one second. Good little head tilt. Thank you. Fantastic. So this is my camera bag and this is all my equipment that I take on the road with me. Um, I have a 5D Mark II. Um, I leave this lens on here. This is my most used lens. It is a 24-70. to 70. I also carry tons of batteries. 
um, because you always have to have batteries, you're always switching them out. The cameras really suck up the battery juice, so um, the camera battery is a charge, but these are actual battery driven. And then also I have business cards and everything else you might think you need, camera lens, cleaners, and everything that you need just to get through a shoot for the day. So one of the most rewarding experiences that I have being a photographer, it's an interesting story. When I was a senior in high school, I had my senior photos done and I was dreading it. I hated them and I had them done four different times by four different photographers. So for me to be doing high school seniors and the volume that I do is kind of ironic. One of the most special things, not that I want any, anyone coming in here feeling insecure and that they don't feel like they look good or are going to look good in the pictures, but it happens. And the most rewarding experience is when they come in here to see their photos and they love what they see. It makes me cry because I went through it and I knew how they felt. Um, we've had it, we have it happen quite a bit. These girls, they don't think they look good. The boys could kill us if they were even there sometimes. And then when they come in and see them and they love them, you know, the mother cries, I cry, and the kid tells us, you know, we're crazy. <laughs> but it's really rewarding when someone likes what you do, especially when you don't think they're gonna like it. And that was a photographer and that was from Bill Ricca High School. And uh, the producer was Kristen Lacadera. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Kristen, uh, so introduce, or I'll, I'll ask the other two ladies who are sitting on the couch here uh, next to me uh, uh, their names and what part they played in the production. I'm Alexis, and we helped produce and film the video. Okay, and? I'm Vritti, and I also helped produce and film the video. Okay, and now, uh, how do you know uh, Mary Peacock, Kristen? So, she's a local photographer in our town, and I actually interned for her, so I'm very close with her and her family. So, I just really wanted to show her love of photography and her talent through this video. Mm -hmm. And uh, was she a very welcoming uh, uh, for the, to, to this production and, and having you do this? Yes, definitely. She loved every second of it. It was funny to be on the opposite side of the camera for once. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, she's a still photographer, but I'm sure that did she give you any, any tricks or any ideas about uh, how to tape this or any, any, uh, any lighting cues or anything? Yeah, she actually was the one to show us like different angles and different ideas of how to film and where to show and like what would be a good points of the film. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, and now as, as the crew here, what, what was the toughest part of your job as, as crewing this? Um, just finding like good shots of like the photography like pictures because they were all so beautiful. Yeah, so yeah. Um, and? Definitely picking out which pictures to show in the video because yeah. all of her pictures are amazing. Yeah, yeah, she's an amazing photographer, yeah, isn't she? The, the, yeah. the pictures are so clear and, and now what kind, of, what kind of camera did you use? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I used a Canon T6S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, does uh, does Bill Ricca High School have a, a media department? They do. Um, I'm, we're actually not in it, but <laughs> we're in this media literacy class with their teacher, Mr. Landry. He um, was the one to give us all the equipment, the microphone, and just everything that allowed this video to be possible. Okay. And we know Mr. Landry. He's uh, he's had students yeah. participate in this before, and and he's had winners too. So mm -hmm. uh, he's, yeah. he's he does quite a quite a good job. So what what year are you, Kristen? I'm a senior. In High school. You're senior. Mm -hmm. And do you want to uh, uh, continue a career in, in, uh, in, this, in this area? Yeah, actually I do want to do photography and film. It's always been something I've been interested in. Yeah. Uh, any concrete plans yet? Not yet. I'm still kind of figuring out what exactly I want to do with it, but definitely a dream of mine. Okay, very good. So Kristen Lacadera, and say your name again? Alexis. Ritti. Okay, and thank you ladies. Impulsive, adjective, causing strong dislike or disgust. When you think of these words, you think your fruit has gone bad, a sour taste in your mouth. But do you think of a human being? When I was younger, I couldn't care less about looks. Repulsive wasn't even in my vocabulary. But as I grew older, looks started to matter. A lot. I started to compare myself to every other girl in the school. I thought because I didn't have 
the perfect hair or the perfect smile that I must be repulsive. I began tearing myself down, picking apart my skin, my head filled with thoughts of if only I was prettier. Maybe all the boys wouldn't see me as this gigantic choke. Maybe I'd actually have friends. Repulsive, the word repeated in my mind. I laid in bed, sad songs on repeat. I had learned to hate myself at only age 15. Every compliment is a lie. Someday, I believe, I will not feel repulsive. That day is not today. Until then, I have to wait and just live my life. My name is Shane Miller, and I am repulsive. Though your eyes will need some time to adjust to the overwhelming. And that was What is Beauty? And I'm here with Jenny Miller. And Jenny, you uh, are the. Um, the subject of that video as yes. well as the producer and director of, of, of that piece. You're from Maynard High School? Yes, that's correct. So tell me, what it, it must have taken a lot of courage to, uh, to come up with a piece like that. It's very introspective. Tell us about that. Um, well, uh, <laughs> well, to be honest, yeah, it was really hard to come up with the idea. And once I think I had like one night I was just like sitting in my bed. I had an idea for a, a different project that I was going to do for my teacher. And I came up with this idea of just like, you know, was beauty. And I just started writing and writing and it just came to me and it was just really like powerful. And you know, it was, it was like a release of like all these emotions that I had never gotten to like release before. So. Yeah. Now, had you w did you do this uh, uh, production with an eye to this film uh, uh, video, or did you do it for uh, for a media department in May Maynard High School? I did it for my radio and TV class. It was a project for that, and yeah. Yeah. And what year are you, Jenny? I'm a junior. You're a junior. So is is media and uh, and uh, and video is this something you want to continue doing? I'm not 100% sure yet, but I definitely know I want to continue making videos, whether it's my full-time career or whether it's just on the side. I know I definitely want to stay in this industry. Yeah. Now, the other folks that were in the video with you, tell, tell us about them. What, how did you get them to participate? Um, well, there wasn't much to it. I just I literally walked up to them, and I was like, hey, can I get you my video for two seconds? And they were like, yeah. And then... That was pretty much it. Yeah. Now you scripted. You scripted the whole thing. Yes. And, and uh, so tell tell us how that was. What what was the process that we that you went through? Um, the process. Okay. It was really emotional. To, it was really emotional scripting it because it was just because everything in that video was a hundred percent like based on my life and my experience growing up. Yeah, so. and it, it, as I said before, it must have taken a lot of, uh, of courage to do that. Now, have uh, friends of yours and classmates seen this, and what's been their uh, impression? What's their, been their reaction to this? Well, we showed it in the classroom, and there wasn't really any reaction. Everyone was just dead silent. Like, when the video was over, everyone kind of just looked at each other, and I was just like, oh my goodness, they think it's bad or they're going to think I'm weird or they're going to like have pity for me or something. But, you know, it was fine. Like they just didn't really have a reaction to it because 
I think their minds weren't there yet to think of such mature content. Yeah, no, but I think I think deep down inside, I think they 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 welcomed it, and I think they really really uh, were congratulating you and seeing uh, how much courage it took for you to to come out there with this. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so what is beauty? Maynard High School, and I've been talking with Jenny Miller. Jenny, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, participate? Were you one of the surfers yes. in the? Yes, I was. Yeah, okay. I was one of the surfers. Now, so you are a surfing aficionado, I would take it then. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And now, how did you how did you get into surfing uh, originally? Well, when I was younger, I had always wanted to live in Hawaii and be one of the like Roxy surf girls, and I just thought like surfing was really cool. And then when I was a freshman in high school, I kind of picked up a board and just went out one day and took a lesson, absolutely fell in love with it, and then ever since then, I go out with my friends and I just surf on uh, the East Coast, yeah. Now, what is a Roxy Surf Girl? Is that something I should um, know? Or? Well, Roxy's a company and they have wetsuits, what, surf boards, stickers, all that kind of stuff. They're a big, like, surf company. Uh. Um, and a lot of the girls who are, like, sponsored by Roxy are surfers in Hawaii. And I just, like, look up to them and think they're super cool and yeah. they're really good surfers. Yeah. Now, you took a lot of footage. It looked like that's, what, New Hampshire up there? Is yes, that uh, yes. the beaches so up? Yes, Rye, New Hampshire, and um, Hampton Beach. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, some of your wide shots uh, were, were, were very, very nice. Very, Thank very you. pleasing. Yeah. Now, you, what did you use? A GoPro or something at the end of the surfboard? Tell us how you did that. Yeah. So I have a GoPro Hero 5 at the end of my surfboard and um, a GoPro Hero Session. Yeah. yeah, and so you got some good shots of the, of the people, you know, uh, doing their stuff and yeah. falling off mostly. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't yeah. say that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now uh, the, the other folks in the uh, in the uh, video there, the the shop owner. Yes. So how did you get to know those folks? Um, so I go in that shop almost every summer, multiple times a week, and I talk to the manager Phil Carey, and he really helped me a lot. We had like a 30-minute interview. Um, and he just told me all about his experience with surfing and where he's gone and how long he's been surfing and just like why he likes it. So I really got to know him um, on like a more deeper level, level other than just going into the surf shop saying hi, <laughs> buying some clothes. Um, and then the other man, fit, or David Holliday, was just a local surfer that I met one day when I was shooting um, and I was just trying to get some b-roll and I found him and I just started asking him a couple questions what he liked about surfing and he was actually uh, kind of new to start surfing and he and his son would go surfing together and his son is now in college but he wanted to keep up going mm -hmm. surfing so yeah. now he's off doing his own thing yeah surfing. now who was that young dude that was talking to us about those gnarly 12-foot waves um that, so like that lingo huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's my boyfriend and his name is miles he's flink he has been surfing since he's was like three years old he's just like you would think that he's from california because he just <laughs> he is, sounds like it <laughs> yeah yeah he really does he's great um and yeah he's a great surfer big skier just kind of an all-around action sports yeah. guy now uh did i ask you what year you are i'm a junior you had to junior. think about yeah, that no, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. so and and have you taken any of the uh, media courses at westwood high school um so i originally went to walnut hill school for the arts freshman year and was a visual arts major and then sophomore year i didn't take any video production but i knew that i liked video production and that's when i went back to westwood and then I took my first video production official class this year. Yeah. So what did you think of the final results you got on this on this video? Um, I was really happy with it. Um, and we had a pretty strict deadline, so it was kind of like hard to get in everything. But if I could go back, I would definitely change maybe like a few things here and there. But I was really pleased overall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. a good effort. Now, does does uh, uh, are you familiar with the Westwood, the local access station in Westwood? Yes. Yes. So I've been in contact with them for a little bit and just trying to figure out like little internships here and there. Um, and some work that I could do maybe over the summertime. So yeah, I have been, I have been in contact with them. Yeah, fantastic. All right. So Bella Messina and uh, Surf Addiction. Thank you, Bella. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, my name is Nora Collins. I am 16 years old and lucky enough to attend Walnut Hill, a high school for the performing arts. I am able to spend my days both studying academics and playing my oboe. 
I am saddened to know that other girls my age will never get such opportunities. Instead, they are married as children. More than 700 million women alive today were married before the age of 18, and some 250 million were married before the age of 15. I'm Rylan and I'm a 17-year-old dancer. In 2011, it was estimated that over 9.4 million children in the U.S. were married at the age of 16 or younger, and 1.7 million were married at the age of 15 or younger. Between 2000 and 2010, 250,000 child marriages took place. Some of these children were as young as 12. The majority were girls. I'm Monacy. I'm a 16-year-old visual artist. In Massachusetts, from 2000 to 2014, there were nearly 1,200 children as young as 14 who got married. 84% 1,000 girls were wed to adult men. Existing law in Massachusetts has no minimum for child marriage. However, case law has a minimum of at least 12 years old. Judges are also allowed to hear petitions from the minors who wish to get married. Consent of at least one parent is usually necessary, and parents usually consent if not approve these marriages. My name is Naya and I'm a 16-year-old dancer. These girls who are getting married are almost always wed to older men. Marriage of minors is not romantic. In these marriages, the age difference could lead to statutory rape charges. For these girls, marriage means rape on their wedding night and thereafter. I'm Julie De, and I'm a 17-year-old double bassist. Girls who marry in their teens tend to have more children, earlier and more closely spaced. This can prevent them from accessing educational and work opportunities. It limits their financial ability and their earning power. Also, 70 to 80% of marriages involving children end in divorce. For teen mothers, marrying and then later divorcing can more than double the likelihood of poverty. I'm Izzy and I'm a 15 year old actor. Cultural and religious norms that confine girls to traditional roles and block their access to education and participation in public life are deeply rooted and resistant to change. Married children, because they are minors, face many obstacles when they try to leave or resist such a marriage. They have difficulty trying to bring in legal action, including filing for divorce. They are unable to open or rent a checking account, and because of their marital status, they are uneligible for services from the Department of Children and Families. I'm Max, and I'm a 17-year-old visual artist. Married before age 18 has such long-lasting, devastating consequences that the U.S. State Department has classified it as human rights abuse. In 1979, the UN had adopted a treaty that specifically prohibits child marriage and calls legislation to set a minimum marriage age. The U.S. Senate has not adopted this, however, even though President Jimmy Carter signed and sent over for ratification this treaty in 1980. American girls have suffered. I'm Taylor and I'm a 15-year-old pianist. Since minors' parents consent to and often encourage these marriages, children forced into marriage can't turn to family for help in getting out. Those who do manage to escape report married lives filled with sexual assault and other abuse. Their lives are forever changed. Please help us pass H2310 and S785, an act to end child marriage in Massachusetts. This act would prohibit marriage in the Commonwealth below the age of 18. No exceptions. Now is the time to end the scourge of child marriage. Now is the time to give other girls like us a chance to chase their own dreams. an act to end child marriage. And I have with me Harriet Rovniak. Hi. 
And uh, you are listed in the credits as the cinematographer, videographer of this piece? Yes, and director. And, and yeah. Okay. And you go to Walnut Hill School? Yes, I do. Yeah. And now where is Walnut Hill School? It's in Natick. It's a private school for the arts. Okay. And now they, you weren't actually in the video itself. What, what, what is your forte? I was in, but um, it's a longer version and mm -hmm. it was edited down for this festival. But um, yeah, my vision was my friend Nora Collins, who was the other creator, yeah. read an article by Nicholas Kristoff mm -hmm. in the New York Times, which mm -hmm. caused her to do a lot of research, which made her realize that this was a pressing issue. Mm -hmm. And she decided to enlist my help because I'm a film student and we made this film and we showed it at the state house yeah, yeah. and y you showed it to the legislators in the state house yeah we showed it to senator harriet chandler we showed it to representative k Khan and a bunch of um, other representatives right now th there's actually a house bill and a senate bill that's mentioned in the video that are yes. active bills right now or, uh, um it did not get passed oh it did not get passed no it got passed over okay so it w went to committee and never made it out of committee yes. Okay. Now, so uh, your your friend Nora uh, gave you the idea for this. So, uh, uh, how did you enlist the the uh, help of the other students that were uh, that were in the piece? So they were all our friends, and our school is very close knit. There's only like 300 people, and it's like very diverse. So we were able to grab some dancers, some visual artists, and we just gave them some topics to talk about. And Nora had gotten a lot of facts to put into like a script mm -hmm. and. It was really, we had great people working with us. Yeah, and, and uh, so Walnut Hill does have a media program? Yeah, um, I'm in the department um, called Writing, Film, and Media Arts. So I focus in screenwriting, poetry, fiction, photography, film. It's a newer department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have to compliment you because the, the, the shot selection and your composition was really very, very good, quite Thank good. Thank you. Yeah. Now, are you familiar with the, uh, you, you're from Natick, right, did yes. you say? So are you familiar with the local access station in Natick? Pegasus? Uh, well, I don't know what they're, I think, if they're called. I, think it is Pe I worked there, like, I went there once with a theater program I did. Okay. So we, I do know it a little bit. Yeah. So are you, uh, are you pleased with the final result of it? Did it, did it kind of, um, it, was it what you expected when you first started? Yeah, we, sh we were able to show it at our school. Um, people loved it. It was great. Of course, I'm a film student, so I'm always nitpicking at things like yeah. focus and audio and stuff. But yeah. that's just places for improvement. Yeah. And I imagine that, you know, you're, you're, you were really dealing with statistics about, um, uh, U U.S., I guess, or Massachusetts, but you did mention some international statistics as well during the, the, the film. Yeah, I mean, when people think about child marriage, they don't think about the U.S. as much. They think about international. They think about, like, over where they where it doesn't affect them. So when they realize that it is in the United States and it's such a big deal, they're really shocked. Yeah. So, uh, well, it, it's a tough subject to tackle and it's something that we've uh, 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 never had, uh, you know, anybody do a production on this on this topic before. So you're to be congratulating for tackling quite a, a tough one. So, um, so Harriet Rovniak and it was uh, an act to end child marriage mm -hmm. from the Walnut Hill School. Congratulations, Thank Harriet. Thank you. Thank you so much. My collection first began in 2014 when I happened to find the remains of a rat in my neighborhood. So I brought the skeleton home and I left it in some bleach. My mom was very supportive and she really didn't mind as long as I wore some gloves and then washed my hands afterwards. After a few days of soaking, the bones came out white like a museum specimen and I put them in a display. Since then, I've continued to collect bones as I find their remains in my neighborhood. Hi, my name is Amire Razai Kamalabad and I collect bones. I've always been interested in natural history museums, scientific research collections, and taxidermy. So to explore these interests, I volunteer at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. I've met with a zoo archaeologist to learn about her profession, and I've even visited a taxidermist to see his studio. 
Essentially, I'm trying to learn the techniques that would be used by museum professionals to clean bones, but I'm also figuring out the DIY version of the process. Usually when I find an animal's remains, it's just the skeleton. Sometimes there's a little bit of meat attached to the bones or skin, and other times it's the entire animal. In this case, I'll soak the bones in water. It's a process called maceration and it helps remove any meat or feathers or fur from the bones. Then the bones are soaked in hydrogen peroxide, which helps whiten the bones and remove oils from within them to give them a whiter appearance. Following this, the bones are just left out to dry. In my collection, I have many bits and pieces from different animal skeletons. I have the bones from a rat, an opossum, a goose, a pigeon, a seagull, um, and some other unidentified birds and animals. In my collection as well, I have some other specimens that I've prepared myself. I preserved a snake that I found in my neighborhood in a jar of alcohol, and the skins of birds I have framed because I was unable to taxidermy them. When I frame a bird's skin, I'm highlighting the beauty and detail of its feathers and showcasing the art within nature. In some ways, the process of cleaning bones can be a little gross, and some might even say it's morbid. But really, in our lives, we're surrounded by the remains of dead animals, especially in the foods we consume. And personally, I think that I feel more detached to the meat of an animal because when I eat it, it doesn't look like it comes from an animal. Whereas with the bones I collect, they very obviously look like part of an animal, and so I'm reminded more of its death. It leads me to have a stronger appreciation for the animal's life, and it reminds me that I share my neighborhood with more beings than just people. And that was Collect, and I'm here with Amire Rezai Kamalabad. Ka Close. <laughs> Kamalabad. <Yeah. laughs> you say it. Amire Rezai Kamalabad. Okay, very good, Amire. Now, you're in, uh, we're in, at Cambridge Ringe in Latin High School? Um, I actually homeschool, but I live in Cambridge, and I attend the media arts after school that um, is like affiliated with the high school in Cambridge. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, Collect. Um, uh, so tell us, uh, I, I guess the movie kind of, <clears throat> or the video is self-explanatory how you got involved in this, but tell us again how you got involved with this kind of thing. Yeah, so I've always been interested in natural history museums and their like collection of specimens, and it's a career that I'm like interested in pursuing in the future. Um, so kind of on my own, I picked it up as a hobby, learning how to clean bones and um, learning about like taxidermy and museum professionals and how they preserve natural specimens. Yeah. Now, did you do all of the setup, uh, the video setup, or did you have any kind of a crew working with you? No, so that was like completely made by me. I I was like using mirrors behind the camera to like manual focus on myself and uh, oh wow um, yeah, and then uh, creating like little installations that I thought looked nice that I could like film uh, my specimens along. Yeah, so you have these little specimen boxes and these collections at home, or do you show them? Do you take them like to hobby clubs or things like that? No, so mostly um, my collection has just been um, in my house and like just in boxes that I display in my room. So like with the film, I was interested in uh, showcasing them so that I could share them like with more of my friends and with the community and have it um, like be something where I could show off my um, hobby and interest without having to like bring out the bones everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're uh, so you participate in the after school program at Cambridge Ringe and Latin, which is a media program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm a film mentor at the program, so I help teach other students um, how to use cameras and edit films. Right. And how did you get your uh, your uh, talent? How did you how did you get your training? Um, in terms of filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, I think I've just spent a lot of time like in art museums and various. Um, museums and just looking at how other artists create their work so I'm really inspired by um, 
like the films I watch. I'm a big fan of documentaries, so thinking about um, some of my favorite films and the ways that artists um, use visual imagery and um, narratives to create right. a story. And what what year are you? I'm a senior this year. You're a senior this year. So what what are your future plans for college? Um, I'm interested in like having a very like interdisciplinary education, so studying visual arts, but also connecting it to a science like anthropology or biology to show that like sciences are a very creative practice. And that's like what I tried to do in my film is to show that museum collections, though they're for um, scientific research, they also have an element of art and beauty and curiosity attached to them. Yeah, and I think in today's world, if you look at some of those uh, 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 national geo channels and some of those other kinds of channels, the, the science as well as the presentation, the videography, are, are kind of in a piece of, of themselves, so, mm -hmm. that, so that they're kind of, uh, kind of uh, wound together very, very tightly, aren't they? Yeah, I think uh, wildlife photography especially, um, especially like with activism, um, showing the natural world and uh, how it's being affected by global warming, um, and filmmaking has such an influence on like communicating that to, public, to the mm -hmm. public. Yeah, now I have to ask you kind of a silly question, okay. uh, but uh, you know, usually when you, when you have a, a high school girl in the attractive high school girl um, and you talk about you know uh, bringing a rat home you know it's, it's a kind of gross and whatever so how, what, what, what do you have to say to someone who says gee how could you touch a rat how could you do that kind of stuff um, well uh can you can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it usually when people think about handling dead rats, you know, it, like you say yourself, it's gross and it's kind of icky, right? Yeah. If I can use that term. So, so uh, what uh, what's your take on it? Because it, it obviously you have no problem with yeah. uh, with, with that. Well, first of all, I don't think uh, my attractiveness or looks have anything <laughs> to do with uh, my hobby. Um, but uh, I think you know, in um, like at the end of the film too, I talk about like our consumption of meat and how we're okay with seeing some imagery that's related to death and, am and animals' death because sure. it's normalized in our society. Um, and if you think about rats, we um, are killing rats because we view them as a menace. Um, so I don't see there to be that much of a difference between um, like uh, killing livestock and killing the rats in our neighborhood. So yeah. if I can pick up a rack, if I can pick up um, like a rack of ribs at the grocery store, then why can't I pick up pick a rack? <laughs> very good, very good answer. Uh, now, I, I was very uh, taken with the, with the one uh, uh, scene you had there where you had the refrigerator door open and you had the foods that we typically buy uh, at the grocery store and then you had the little skeletons mixed in with there. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I think that's kind of emphasis emphasize that idea that um, like the way we view, um, like there's there are many layers to how we see the death of an animal. Like if it's a pet, if it's a cow that we um, buy part of their body at a grocery store, if it's a rat that we see on the street, um, if it's a deer that we see killed by a hunter, um, just like our perception of meat and animals and death um, is very um, connected to the context um, in which it's in and uh, how our society like normalizes it or views it as acceptable or um, you know, views it as unacceptable too. Very good, Amiri. Very wi wise words. So that's Amiri Rezai Kamalabad. Did I say that better this time? Rezai. <laughs> Rezai Kamalabad. Yeah. Okay, Amiri. I'll just call you Amiri. <laughs> All right, uh, Amiri, uh, uh, Collect, Cambridge Ringe and Latin High School. Homeschool. Homeschool. Okay, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there you have it, uh, the end of another 2018 Documentary Student Film Festival here at Cinema Salem. And uh, I think we can truthfully say that these young student filmmakers uh, are very good at their craft, they're good technically at what they do, and uh, the subject matter that they cover uh, is often tough. It takes a lot of courage to tackle some of these issues, and they do a good job uh, at, uh, at that. Uh, this is Walt Kosmowski for BevCam at Cinema Salem, and we'll see you next time.